The views expressed in this podcast do not reflect those of our training institutions or the APA. The information discussed is intended for educational purposes only and should not be used for diagnosis or treatment. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the AJP Residence Journal podcast. My name is Priya Giran and I'm one of the media editors. Today I am so excited to talk about perinatal mental health with Dr. Edwin Raffi. Dr. Raffi is a board-certified psychiatrist at the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Women's Mental Health and an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He is also chief medical officer for Column Health Clinic, which provides outpatient dual diagnosis care. He completed psychiatry residency at Harvard South Shore and fellowship in perinatal and reproductive psychiatry at the MGH Center for Women's Mental Health. Dr. Raffi, thanks so much for joining me today. Would you mind starting us off by sharing with our listeners uh, your own personal journey to psychiatry and perinatal psychiatry in particular? Absolutely. Uh, Very nice to be here, Priya. Thank you for having me. It is an honor and a pleasure. Uh, I I did a master's in public health before I went to medical school. uh, So I decided that I was going to be a doctor, but had not really decided what type of doctor. My father is an OBGYN, and at some point he sort of nudged me towards obstetrics and gynecology. He said it was a good field. I liked surgery. He said, you know, it's, it's a happy field. Oftentimes people are pregnant and not um, you know, quote unquote, ill or sick. Um, and so I really thought that I, I would, I might do OBGYN and I really like endocrinology and I thought I might do, you know, reproductive endocrinology. And when I did my psychiatry res- uh, rotation, I just, uh, absolutely loved it and thought that, um, there was, it was surprisingly, you know, I, I always found psychiatry and psychology in the brain amusing and amazing and sort of uh, fell in love with it. And then I did my OB rotation and I liked it, but not as much as I liked psychiatry. And so I chose, you know, I uh, then I I was convinced that the, the brain was my organ. If I was going to treat the entire body, uh, it was sort of going to be the organ that runs the entire body anyways. Uh, and then I was picking between neurology and psychiatry. And, and, you know, through my interview process, it was very clear to me that I want to do psychiatry. Uh, I actually heard about perinatal and reproductive psychiatry during my residency interviews. And at the time, I was like, this is very specific. That that sounds a little too specific. Uh, (laughs) uh, But now that I've uh, I've really gone into the world, you know, it's it's kind of cheating because you're somewhat uh, subspecialized and super subspecialized, but it's in half the population. And it's also the half the population that tends to uh, really seek help. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I got to tell you, the way I got into reproductive, uh, perinatal reproductive psychiatry was because uh, when, uh, as a psychiatry resident, I was sort of where you are right now. I think I was a second, actually exactly where you are because we were in the same residency program as well. Um, <laughs> and I went into psychiatry thinking it's newer science. Uh, it's a field where if you, you know, if you find the smallest, newest thing, you could really make a big change in the world in helping uh, a big, larger number of people. And while, uh, you know, I, while I was in my psychiatry residency, I sort of went back to my roots of what I like most, which is the endocrine system. And I, I always find it fascinating because it's sort of like this wireless system that in a way it controls, you know, it, it's the brain's way of controlling the body and the body relating you know, different parts of itself and the, and the, and the mind. I was thinking we don't do enough with uh, the endocrine system in psychiatry. You know, we look at the thyroid, we might look at whether or not someone's a diabetic, but beyond it, you know, you don't really delve in. And I really wanted to, so I really literally went and started Googling, you know, uh, endocrinology in psychiatry, psychoneuroendocrinology. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and I found that everything that came up was women's mental health and all the research is in perinatal and reproductive psychiatry. And I was already in Boston, which the two programs that kept popping up were MGH and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which was very lucky for me because I was already doing my residency here. Uh, and so I, you know, I, uh, did a rotation at the MGH and got into, uh, you know, became a perinatal and reproductive psychiatrist. That's so awesome. I love hearing people's stories about where they've gotten to where they are. Um, 
I think especially for residents, it, it can be very inspiring when you're just kind of wondering, how am I, what, what is my career going to look like? So thank you so much. That's, that's really cool. I'll tell you one thing. I think one, one word of advice I got from Dr. Chang, who's my mentor when I was a resident, was that you will certainly find your way. You just have to follow your heart and, and you know, see where you are, where you are at any point and sort of being at the right place, the right time, showing up, and then you, you sort of make your own way. So having good mentorship is important. Uh, but also going back to your roots and seeing what sort of turns uh, your brain on and what 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 really appeals to you. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um, so, Dr. Rafi, to kind of start us, can you give us some background about the prevalence of mental illness um, in the perinatal period, and maybe even just starting with defining uh, the perinatal period? What are we actually talking about when we say that term? So absolutely. So uh, the perinatal period, I think if you look it up, uh, it would say something like the time right before birth all the way into the postpartum uh, period. As it pertains to when we talk about perinatal reproductive psychiatry, I'd say the entire time of pregnancy and into the postpartum state. Um, postpartum could be defined from anywhere. You know, people usually go up to three months, but really, I, I would th- I would say a year after delivery, or so to some people more. I think uh, back to when your norm- hormones sort of normalize, wherever breastfeeding ends, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, the perinatal period, you could sort of define it as pregnancy in the postpartum state. And then your next question, I think, was sort of prevalence of disease uh, during the perinatal period, right? Uh, so obviously, there's a ton of different psychiatric disorders we talked about. So between all of those, I think the most prevalent ones are what you often hear is you know, just generally in the population is depression and anxiety. And I think when we talk about pregnancy, people just oftentimes think postpartum depression, right? That's the first mm-hmm. thing that might pop into pop into mind. Um, and, and that is, in fact, the most prevalent uh, you know, issue uh, with women of reproductive age during the perinatal period if not just psychiatrically, just in general, to basically uh, about 10 to 15% of all pregnancies lead to an episode of postpartum depression. Oh, so, wow. And, or, or postpartum depression affects approximately 10 to 15% of our pregnancies. So, yeah, so it's a high preference, right? And and so this is a clinical depression. When you talk about uh, postpartum uh, just blues, which is just you know, having some symptoms. It's not really depression. It's not a clinical thing that needs intervention, just needs some supportive care. That numbers can go up to from 50 to 85%. And some of that might transit into depression, some of it might not. Uh, so, so, you know, very prevalent. And people who have, women who have a history of depression are at a threefold increased risk for having postpartum depression. It's one of those things where your past history is the better, best indicator of what's going to happen. If you have depression during your pregnancy, you're uh, at a much higher risk of up to 75% of having postpartum depression. And so it's, it's important to know who's at risk and also to sort of intervene. You know, people that would be at risk are uh, people who have a, obviously a previous history of postpartum depression, people who have depression during pregnancy, like I just said, uh, people who just have a general history of depression or bipolar disorder, uh, people who have recent stressful life events, inadequate social support, marital problems. You know, just like anything else, it's sort of a biopsychosocial uh, confluence of things that could happen to set somebody there, but very prevalent. Other things that we'd want to discuss, I think, as far as disorders of related to postpartum depression or related to postpartum state or, or just a perinatal state, greater than 10 percent of women experience clinically significant symptoms of anxiety uh, during pregnancy, especially during the first trimester. If you think a lot of women experience, let's say, nausea during pregnancy, right? First trimester, nausea, morning sickness. And anxiety and nausea become, especially in people who have a history of anxiety, become a chicken, chicken or egg thing. You know, it's just, nausea can make people very anxious. Anxiety can pe- make people very nauseous. So that's a good way of remembering that first trimester uh, and anxiety are, are very highly linked. And then as far as other psychiatric things, if I were to discuss one other thing, it would be postpartum psychosis, uh, which affects uh, one to two uh, in a thousand women after childbirth. So... You know, prevalence wilds lower, but but uh, of a uh, 
very significant uh, importance because it could be so uh, devastating. Uh, it's, it could be very dramatic, as you could right. imagine. You know, people usually have symptoms as early as 48 to 72 hours after delivery. Uh, usually what we call you know, preverbal psychosis develops symptoms within the first couple of weeks, although it could be sort of after that, any, any time postpartum. And, and it's sort of a waxing and waning presentation. It's sort of, uh, it's almost like delirium in a way, you know, or it could you know, come and go. Um, people can get more or less psychotic. They could have delusional beliefs. They can have command auditory hallucinations to, you know, harm themselves or, or the infant, which is really the worst, you know, dramatic events is, you know, homicide and infanticide, uh, which is a real thing and could happen in this population. So certainly a psychiatric emergency that could be as a result of a bipolar diathesis or it could be just circumscribed postpartum psychosis. Uh, but certainly uh, one of those things that, that we, we have to pay close attention to. And once we know, this is one of those things that if you're more aware than the next person, you see someone in a, in a psychiatric emergency room and they explain an episode of psych, you know, psychosis to you and the mother agrees, but now they're appearing just fine in front of you because it waxes and wanes, you would know to hospitalize that patient. Uh, so those are some of the, I think, more prevalent or more dangerous ones that we would want to discuss. Yeah, thank you so much for going over that. That's, I think, I'm glad you covered some of the more common things like postpartum depression and anxiety, but also the psychosis because you know, especially if you're not doing a fellowship and that you don't necessarily see a whole lot of that or maybe any of that in residency. So it's definitely good to be aware of. Um, and kind of, you know, related to that, I'm curious, I mean, I think we could spend hours talking about, you know, different psychiatric medications in these patients and for the different conditions, um, just because there's so much to discuss. And actually, um, you know, in 2019, you and co-authors published an article discussing the safety of these different medications um, during pregnancy, which I actually found to be a really great overview. And I hope our listeners check that paper out. Um, it's, it's really helpful. It goes through pretty much all of the medications you could think of from antidepressants to antipsychotics for even including some substance use treatments. So anyway... Um, I guess for the purposes of this podcast, what are some major points that, you know, especially residents, fellows should be aware of regarding psychiatric medications in the perinatal population? So that's a great question. I think, uh, so when we talk about medications and pregnancy, I think it pays dividends to take a step back and sort of shift the focus from, because everyone's very focused on what's the risk of exposure especially for the infants, to these medications, right? And I think it pays evidence to sort of step back and shift the focus to uh, what would be the risks of no treatment? And it's an important thing to note. It's an important conversation to have with the mother uh, and the partner and whoever uh, you know, would be a part of the family unit if, if possible, uh, because... And, and to write in the con consent, you know, usually oftentimes we put in our, in our notes, discuss risks, benefits, and alternatives of the medication. In this case, you'd want to say during pregnancy to the mother and the infant. And one of the things to note is including risks of no treatment because, because we have so much data about what would happen should someone not get treated for you know, depression or anxiety or psychosis of mania. And so once, once you put those things in perspective, I think, uh, and it, anyway, you, you discuss the reproductive safety of the medications, but then it, you get a good um, gauge for whether or not to treat, right? What we know is that pregnancy is, uh, is not protective for uh, mental health conditions. You know, it's, it's a time of stress. Um, it might be positive stress, you know, like a graduation would be a good stress. You know, a wedding might be a good stress. So wanted pregnancy might be a, you know, a good event. It might be something that uh, uh, the patient was looking forward to. But regardless, it puts the body and the brain under stress. You know, if you remember the conversation about allostatic load that, or the overall wear and tear on the body. And so if you have a body that is prone to having a psychiatric illness during pregnancy, you, you might be at higher risk of having uh, relapse of symptoms. Have you ever seen that uh, the Amy Schumer... Um, uh, she has a, uh, she has a Mother's Day commercial 
Have you seen that? Um, I'm not so sure I've seen that one. You should you should definitely it's first of all it's hilarious. Um and it's it's basically her uh, her child walks and asks, you know, mommy, what was it like the day I was born? And she says, oh, my God, it was the most beautiful day I've ever, you know. And then, but it like cuts out to the reality of what was happening when she was giving birth and, you know, the birthing <laughs> process. It's not exactly, you know, all uh, rainbows and butterflies that we draw it out to be. So uh, I, but I, I, I like it because I, you know, I have my mother's look at it because I think it's a good depiction of the reality of the world and, and, uh, and what we draw. And so important to keep in mind to talk to women because, uh, you know, when, when they come and talk about their experience and we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later about, you know, getting a good history, it's sort of, uh, it's important to know how sick they've been in the, in the past. Uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, what has their ailment meant for them? Uh, and then talk to them about what would happen should they become sick again during pregnancy, right? So we have pretty good data for, you know, depression and anxiety. You know, that could lead to, you know, during pregnancy, it could lead to smaller for gestational age babies or risks are of preterm deliveries or low birth rates. Uh, or what would happen if a woman with a history of substance use has relapse during uh, pregnancy or in the postpartum state, right? Because, it's again, it's a stressful situation. If that's a bad coping mechanism, you might relapse into that. Or hysteromania or psychosis, which talk about suicide and infanticide. So... You know, what would happen if you didn't treat? And usually in, uh, in the moderate to severe illness, especially, you sort of would want to treat. And to your question about, you know, sort of how do you decide between medications, you sort of talk about the severity of disorders, as, as we ch- talked about. You talk to them about the history of response they've had to the medications, like what's worked for them, what hasn't. What is their preference and attitude towards treatment, right? This is sort of negotiated care that would tend to get you the best care. Uh, and, and then, you, you know, again, as we said, risks of no treatment. And once you've had the conversation, you know, you, you, then you get into the, uh, data of on the reproductive safety data for the medications, right? You want to pick medications where we have more or well-studied reproductive safety profiles, uh, for the medications. If possible, you want to sort of make those changes prior to the pregnancy, right? So that. Uh, you know, you're not making changes mid-pregnancy where they might be feeling sicker or they might get sicker or you, you'd increase the number number of exposures to the fetus, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and to the extent possible, you want to limit the number of medications uh, to, the, to the infant, right? So you, you know, usually we tend to maximize one medication prior to adding a second medication. Now, having said that, I think what's important is to note that you know, in the U.S., 50% of all pregnancies are unplanned pregnancies, right? And and that number increases to 80% for patients with substance use, specifically opiate use disorder. You know, we're in the middle of an opiate epidemic. And so for those patients, 80% of those patients that get pregnant have, have gone pregnant unplanned. So that should just sort of change your perspective, right? For a patient with a uterus, you should take a step back and say, okay, so... If any of these patients that you're treating could become pregnant if they're of reproductive age at any point, right? So, so let's you know that's good psychiatry, anyways, to limit uh, the number of medications um, and maximize the medications that you use, and use the ones that have good reproductive safety profile. Or if you don't, talk about uh, talk about uh, contraception, right? Uh, uh, because they might be on a medication that, let's say, valproic acid, where you definitely not want them to get pregnant on it, and you sort of would have to have the conversation if you ever decide to put a woman of reproductive age on that medication, which you probably should not. Uh, but but you know, we can talk about this further too, but contraception is an important thing to talk about. You know, I play a lot of primary care as a psychiatrist in my patients, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's an appropriate conversation to have uh, to talk about family planning again because of everything we just talked about. So, Dr. Rafi, do you um, typically then kind of encourage patients to follow up with like their own primary care OBGYN? Do you end up prescribing any of like the contraception yourself? What does that look like in practice? Yeah, so it's a great, great question because contra- because again, the contraceptive pills themselves, as for you know, if it's the pill, if it's you know, first of all, I 
I tend to, you know, have a uh, have them talk to their OBGYN or mm-hmm. their primary care doctor uh, because uh, the options of, of, for contraceptions obviously fall beyond just the oral contraceptives, and if they want to get an IUD or you know, the next plan on or you know any 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 other way of having a contraception that falls outside the scope of psychiatry. Uh, I don't do IUDs <laughs> in my office. <laughs> Fair I enough. don't think anybody, yes. Uh, but uh, so, you know, so you'd want them to have, you know, I think good care, which means have all options available to them and, and, and have a conversation uh, for them to have a conversation about their options and pick whatever works best for them. Having said that, the, the, you know, asking them about what they've tried in the past, whether or not they have tried hormonal contraception or not, whether what type it's been, whether it's progesterone, estrogen based, or was it continuous or interruptive, and how that affected their moods is you know, super important. It gives you a lot of data about whether or not someone uh, someone's mood is affected by their hormones and how is it affected. And you hear, you know, uh, you know, especially in our in our country where a lot of people get started very early for whatever reason. You know, they would have, you know, they'd tell you, oh, my God, I just like broke out in acne. I'd never go back or that just like really was bad for my mood or no, it really regulated my cycles and my mood. And so it gives you some data about helping them pick the best, uh, uh, best modalities of treatment. If it's uh, especially if it's related to things like uh, menstrual cycle related mood and anxiety disorders, which is which is sort of like my baby. I kind of, I, I, that, that stuff I uh, really fascinate me because, again, it goes back to, uh, you know, the endocrine system and psychiatry. And kind of on a related note, um, so you mentioned, yeah, obviously talking about the safety of medications, maximizing medications to avoid using multiple different ones, to avoid multiple different exposures, You know, in your experience, what are some common misperceptions about the use of medications for mental illness in the perinatal period? So great. I mean, great follow up, because then the the flip side of it is this misconception that generally medications are bad for you, right, or are bad for pregnancy. And we just spend some time talking about what would happen if you're not treated and, and, you know, some of the some of the devastating or just very uncomfortable or just bad for pregnancy things that people could go through should they should they not be treated. So I think one of the biggest things is patients or treaters sort of stopping uh, all medications. I think it's not very uncommon to get someone who's second trimester pregnancy, what happened, you know, I found out I was pregnant, so I stopped all my medications. Um, and so... Uh, you know, having uh, the best again, best case scenario, you've planned for it, and but oftentimes that's not the case. And if if it's not, it's not so much that stopping everything, so much as let's get a good history, let's see what's worked, what hasn't, let's see what changes we could make during the pregnancy to sort of uh, make things be very safe for the mother and the baby. So uh, you know, discontinuing medications, especially especially antidepressants, uh, which is just because it's more common, I think uh, you know either either during pregnancy or people are like, oh, you're going to conceive, so you should stop your antidepressants. Uh, Likely not a good idea, especially to people with moderate or severe disease. Uh, Or even like changing doses, you know, to lower doses during pregnancy. You know, you could argue that someone might need higher doses during pregnancy because, A, uh, you have the dilution of medication, and secondly, the person might just get sicker, as we just talked about. And so really, you know, changing doses because they think there, there might be a dose response relationship where often there might not. Uh, or I think one of the most common ones, if you talk to perinatal psychiatrists, is switching to Zoloft. You know, someone's doing really well on an antidepressant for some reason, uh, you know, because of the, some, some of the stuff that was uh, in the earlier literature years ago, decades ago, Zoloft has gotten this rep as like the go-to which is which is not a good thing to do because you know oftentimes you know, if a person is doing really well on uh, you know fluoxetine and and someone decides you know their second trimester uh, pregnant and switching them from with that to Zoloft that might actually be more hurtful than helpful because you know, people could get sicker during cross titration in addition to a second exposure and so on and so forth. And so we would uh, generally not do not switch this all off. Someone's doing well on another medication with a good uh, reproductive safety profile. Um, what are some of the other things? I think uh, 
using the categories, you know, the A, B, C, and X, we don't use those categories anymore. You know, when I give talks, I talk about this being new news, but it's, it's really not. It's old news because it's, you know, starting in 2014, the FDA published the pregnancy and lactation labeling rule where they basically did away with this A, B, C, D, and X because it was, you know, while it was a good attempt into paying attention to this, uh, not the best way of conveying data. And so now the idea is you should know the reproductive safety data of the medications, share it with your patient, and then you make a, a decision together on what would be a good, a good thing to do. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because I think you know, and I think a lot of us still think of that or, you know, learned that somewhere along the way in medical school about these categories. And um, I think just honestly having a risk benefit conversation with the patient about that specific medication makes more sense than just giving them a letter category and saying, here's this letter. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, we, we've sort of moved away from that paternalistic, uh, you know, way of practicing medicine, right? So, you sort of want to lay everything out there for the patient. Patients surprise you with the decisions they make for themselves sometimes. And so far as your you know, conversation consent has been uh, sort of good uh, and all, you know, well-rounded, I think you know, they, they make some good choices. And, you, and when you look at those categories uh, and you look at the data out there, you, you sort of be surprised at, you know, we have drugs that have been in category B, which we don't have a lot of the reproductive safety data on. We have drugs that are in lower categories where we have really good reproductive safety now. So it just doesn't make sense to use those anymore. This also carries into into breastfeeding. Breastfeeding, I think, again, on the issue of misconceptions, you know, people thinking that they shouldn't breastfeed on antidepressants or that taking anti or they should stop their antidepressants because breastfeeding or the other way around. Uh, or, or pumping and dumping, which is it could be very disturbing to the mother, and it could you know get rid of you know, disturbing to the mother's sleep, uh, getting rid of you know good milk, or the other way around. Or there are patients who uh, who are so forced into breastfeeding where it might not be the best uh, the best option for them. If someone with like a, you know moderate to severe history of bipolar disorder, uh, especially let's say someone who's on lithium, where we would likely not want them to breastfeed. And, uh, you know, they have bipolar disorder where their sleep would be very disrupted if they were breastfeeding more than you'd want it to. You know, sleep postpartum is just disrupted anyways. And so, you know, for for a patient that we just described, it might be more uh, helpful to the mother not to breastfeed because then they would get a good chunk of sleep. And sleep, as you know, you know, it could be a chicken or egg situation in bipolar disorder where if they don't get enough sleep, it could lead to the depression or mania or the other way around mania or depression could lead to disrupted sleep uh, and so you would want them to uh, to not breastfeed in a situation uh, breastfeed in a situation like that and and so having you know having good consultation uh, you know, what you really want to do is you want to make a plan that is very specific and tailored to the mother and family uh, and 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 that takes you know good planning and close follow-up so that you can adjust it uh, you know, oftentimes you want to talk to the partner, to the family, to whoever is, is there so that you, you, you can, they can know about each other's mental health. They can know about how to do postpartum planning for all these things uh, so that they and, they and that just by itself provides so much comfort to the family uh, as they go into this transition from, you know, from not having had a child to, uh, you know, parenthood or otherwise adding kids to their, uh, right. to their life. Well, great. So, Dr. Rafi, um, I also wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the Perinatal Psychiatry Fellowship, and especially for our listeners who may be interested in pursuing this for themselves. So, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your fellowship entailed, um, how long it was, what kinds of rotations you did, and maybe some memorable patient experiences? Absolutely. I'll try to, <laughs> to convey some of that stuff. Uh, generally speaking, uh, women's mental health fellowships or perinatal reproductive psychiatry fellowships have really increased um, in numbers uh, since I did them a few years back. Um, and so there is a, a good number of them out there right now, and they vary in uh, sort of content. Uh, they vary in focus. Uh, so I could speak to to my own, uh, and none of them are 
you know, official ACGME fellowships. You know, these are uh, fellowships that are, you know, this is normally what happens is you have uh, you know, fellowships form informally and then you, you know, eventually they, they sort of formalize fellowships. So, but so I can speak to my fellowship. My fellowship was uh, 50% clinical and 50% research. And uh, the clinical part of it had a lot to do with consultations and the consultations could be uh, to for women who didn't have a uh, psychiatrist, so I would maybe become their psychiatrist by way of meeting them for a consultation, or uh, to other psychiatrists or psychiatric nurse practitioners or uh, or primary care doctors or OBGYNs who needed some guidance in caring for their patients. And the consultations could be anything from pregnancy planning, uh, you know, pregnancy-related or postpartum-related issues, menopause-related issues, PMDD related issues, uh, you know, anything, anything women's mental health uh, related, uh, which was, I found it of a lot of value because, uh, you know, I, I just got to see many, a number of cases every week, every, new cases, uh, and also got to talk to different providers about their concerns, their questions, and received very good mentorship uh, and, and really peer supervision in, in learning to, to treat. Uh, to, to diagnose uh, and to treat. So that was sort of the, the clinical uh, uh, leg of my fellowship. Then I was 50% um, research, which was nice because we've had, we had multiple different research uh, programs at the Center for Women's Mental Health at MGH, uh, including the antipsychotic registry, uh, which is an ongoing uh, research project, uh, and, and multiple other studies and what was very nice uh, was that I sort of got a carte blanche on what was my what I wanted to be my area of focus. And you know, I as I told you, I went into this because I uh, found the endocrine system very fascinating. And so the, the you know the I think that the most direct way of studying that in relation to mood and anxiety related disorders is looking at the menstrual cycle. So I uh, spent a year sort of looking into a menstrual cycle related mood and anxiety disorders and sort of wrote a review of the literature that was out there, uh, which was, uh, which was very fun and interesting to me. And I learned a lot. That's really cool. Yeah. So my advice is, you know, look at you know, different people have different priorities, you know, look at, uh, you know, whatever beyond the, what city you want to be in, what academic institution, uh, you know, when you talk to them, ask them about what's, didactics they offer, what are some of the, you know, they might offer other things like uh, know, eating disorders or um, uh, or maybe mood disorders or th they might be more focused on uh, personalities. I don't know. There might be different things and not, not that any of these are specifically women's mental health related, but they do have subspecialties in different places that, that focus on different things. And so uh, I, would, I would ask, what would my debut life be like? How much research, how much clinical things? And I think I think doing a rotation, what really helped me was in my fourth year I did a rotation at MGH where I got to meet the staff. I sort of got to you know meet the people that were so kind to then um, you know guide me through my journey and and mentor me uh, both uh, clinically and uh, and uh, and academically. So you know meet them, you do a rotation with them. You know in the words of Dr. Cohen, who uh, you know was was a person that sort of, uh, should, he's the director of the Center for Women's Mental Health. Uh, you know, he'd say, he, you know, in the beginning when I was there, he said, it's sort of like dating, you know, we, we <laughs> sort of you know, go out and you see how, how you do. And it's just like any other uh, step that you've been through through medical school and residency and fellowship is during your rotation, getting to know them uh, is very helpful in sort of knowing if it's a good place for you. Great words of advice. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and so just maybe to finish off today's podcast, any patient experience that stands out to you? And I think for me, um, I, I mean, I don't know if this is something you'd be willing to talk about, but I'd be interested to hear if, you know, you've had a psychotic patient or a patient with psychosis, just because that's not something I've seen, um, you know, in the perinatal period. So I'll, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you one of the most rewarding things that I've discovered is, is patients who've had, and I'm thinking of uh, 
a patient with postpartum psychosis. I'm thinking of a patient with severe postpartum depression, uh, where you meet them. Usually, you meet these these patients when they're very sick. You know, mm. just like any other illness, people come to the doctor when they're ill, and uh, you know, an experience of seeing someone postpartum uh, and and uh, and finding them to be very very ill, worried about themselves and their infants. You know, the husband or the partner, whoever is there. Uh, being very concerned and then you make a very you know what seems to be a very drastic decision for them because the mother is just given birth the last thing they want to do is be separate from their baby you know they might have an ego dystonic thought of like harming the baby like no intentions but the thought is there and it's really bothersome for them uh or you know if it's a psychotic thing they might actually be thinking about harm either way you know the last thing or that's on the family's mind is separating the mother from the baby which you might end up doing if the patient goes inpatient right you know uh or whatever measure you take to, to sort of help the patient then they, they feel better and then you sort of uh you know work uh the family through this very very hard time you know it's a traumatic event something that people you know expect to be this you know, again go back to the amy schumer thing <laughs> you know expect to be a certain way and it turns out to be a different way uh but what, the beauty of women's mental health or prenatal reproductive psychiatry i think is that you get to f- follow people through their life cycle right no matter where you meet them if it's you know they've just transitioned into college or if they've just partnered up or they've just gotten pregnant or you know, a lot of a lot of women now get pregnant uh, uh you know later in their 30s or uh, even early 40s and so you uh you know they go through IVF and you know the challenges that brings all the way through menopause and so you get to you get to follow women through their history so in in a case that I just told you you go through this experience you you know you carry the family through this challenge they come out and then let's say they want to get pregnant again and this actually I, this is just coming to mind because i just had this uh, uh happen where i had another patient who was just uh pregnant went through the first you know the first pregnancy was very difficult and that's where i met them and this pregnancy just went uneventful because we acted preventively we knew what we we're dealing with the patient was treated throughout the entire thing and then you know during their pregnancy and postpartum period monitored very closely and then, you know, just like any other thing in psychiatry, if you do your job well, it's like nothing has happened, right? Like this is when this is the beauty and uh, it could be the challenge of our, you know, if, if people are well and happy and things are going as, as they should, you've done your job right. But in, in this in this sort of patient population, they appreciate that so much. And then you get to appreciate that, you know, the, the, the experience this time was much closer to what they would have expected the first time. And that I think is a gift uh, that 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 I think first of all having the pleasure and the honor and uh, and sort of a lot people allowing you to be a part of their lives to sort of you know care for them once, but then also having the uh, capability of of following people through their lifetime and and seeing the development, seeing how you know you can act preventively. You know, I think one of the biggest things I, I like this public health hat of you know prevention, of learning to act preventively in. And mental health and then uh, allowing for families to have uh, you know amazing uh, different results uh, is is i think those are some of my favorite stories well i think you've inspired hopefully some of our listeners to at least consider <laughs> um, perinatal and reproductive psychiatry those are some pretty cool stories thank you so much for sharing that and you know, thank you in general for sharing all the information today. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. Any last piece of advice or last words you'd like to share before we sign off for today? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, Priya. This is uh, this is wonderful. Uh, uh, I hope that people are inspired. I'm <laughs> happy to answer any questions uh, at any point. I think if I were going to leave you with any, I think one of the things I've learned is uh, again, the importance of, of one of the things we don't learn as a psychiatrist, or we might not learn as psychiatrists, is uh, to get a, a really good history, including an obstetrics and gynecological history for uh, you know people at uterus of reproductive age. Uh, you know, looking at charting the moods and correlations to the menstrual cycle. You know, talking about contraceptions and hormonal changes and how that could affect their symptoms throughout life cycle. Talking about family planning and then getting a good history of their pregnancies you know uh pregnancies could be amazing events or could be traumatic events depending on what the outcome is 
and you know not shying away from getting that good history because it's a it's a big part of of their life and i think oftentimes we forget so if i were to leave you one extra piece of of information i think it would be that awesome well once again thank you so much dr rafi and thank you to our listeners for tuning in today um Please feel free to follow us on our social media accounts and also subscribe to our podcast, American Journal of Psychiatry, Residence Journal. All right. See you later.